Our reading from, uh, from Isaiah this morning sets the stage for what is coming. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse. As a reminder, Jesse was, da- was King David's father. So from the line of David, this little child who will lead them shall come. For this same reason, our reading from Romans is chosen, which quotes Isaiah about the root of Jesse. Anyone ever heard that David wrote the Psalms? Yeah. That David wrote the Psalms has long been tradition, as many of the Psalms are full of the kingship theme and some clearly relating to the challenges and perils of an earthly king. Truth is, we don't know the author of the Psalms. We don't know for sure that David was literate. If you'll remember, when he enters the story, he's in the fields tending the sheep. We do know that many of the Psalms are about David, which as the first leader in Israel who organized society in such a way that he could employ scribes, makes sense. Most scholars today would say the Psalms had many authors. Whatever the case, many of the Psalms are about David, and many of them are about kingship, in a general way. Today's psalm has such a theme. Now, those of you who like to pay attention to details might have noticed that some of the verses of the psalm were missing from what we read today. Some of those verses, like 12 and 13, echo what is said here. For he shall deliver the poor who cries out in distress and the oppressed who has no helper. He shall have pity on the lowly and the poor. He shall preserve the lives of the needy. And then there are some that relate much more to the challenges and perils of an earthly king, like verses 9 and 10. His foes shall bow before him, and his enemies lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall pay tribute, and the kings of Arabia and Saba offer gifts. I bring this up to show that that the folks putting the lectionary together are trying to point us in this season of Advent, not to a King David, earthly kind of king, but to a coming Messiah kind of king, a different kind of king. You see, kings weren't generally concerned with the poor. They were more concerned with winning wars, defending territory, peace for the sake of prosperity, because If people aren't making money, it's really difficult to tax them. So what do we have going on in the psalm? Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son, that he may rule your people righteously and the poor with justice that the mountains may bring prosperity to the people and the little hills bring righteousness. He shall defend the needy among the people. He shall rescue the poor and crush the oppressor. You see, the emphasis here for this king is for this king to be different, one who raises up poor and needy and actually crushes those who oppress others. 
Now let's shift back to Isaiah. Things are clearly going to change when the child who leads them is to come. The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the kid, the calf and the lion shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. This new kind of peace will not be just a ceasing of violence among humans, but all creation will be affected. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Part of the reason I bring this up is to point out that God's vision for the future from these Old Testament texts. Sometimes we struggle with the God we hear about in the Old Testament. We can be tempted to talk as if there are two gods, one of the Old Testament and one of the New Testament. They are one and the same God. And if we look at the overarching theme of the Old Testament, we will see a God of love, forgiving and returning to God's people, even if he's not happy with them. God's vision for how God wants creation to evolve is there from the beginning. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. In our gospel reading, John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Messiah. Once again, we hear from Isaiah as Matthew quotes, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. The most interesting thing about this passage is the wild and crazy John and the details about his dress and his diet. We get a glimpse into what he thought of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you brood of vipers, he called them. But I want to talk about a much less interesting topic, which is John's beef with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You remember Jesus' primary beef with the Pharisees and the Sadducees? He was concerned that in their religious leadership and authority, they were too concerned with keeping the law to the exclusion of the point of the law, which was the care and prospering all the community, including the orphans and the widows, the poor and the needy, for whom there was no safety net. I think we Americans have a blind spot with respect to our interdependence. Our national identity is all about independence. Independence and individual responsibility might be the primary characteristics we use as we evaluate the worthiness of someone else. Now, don't get me wrong, independence and individual responsibility aren't bad things, quite the opposite. But neither are they everything. We often overlook our interdependence. We need each other. We might have had an ancestor somewhere who was a subsistence farmer, but not anymore. Anyone want to live without electricity? Anyone want to live without the love and the touch and the company of our loved ones? Jesus was all about the interdependence. 
which includes helping those in need. In her book, Viral Justice, Ruha Benjamin argues that our interdependence is indeed sacred, a holy thing. Understanding that all our forms of existence are inextricably linked. We become better stewards, better caregivers, better joy spreaders, and better justice spreaders. And we recognize that our participation in an unjust system, even if it's not unjust to us, makes us all sick. This idea is well illustrated in our familiar parable of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite pass by the injured man in the ditch. The excuse sometimes given is that touching a corpse would leave them ritually unclean and unable to perform their duties in the temple. Which is precisely the point Jesus is trying to make about the religious leaders of his time. In the moment, they have missed what is most important. Not only to the one injured in the ditch, but indeed to God. And so when John, when he chides the Pharisees and the Sadducees and says, bear fruit worthy of repentance, he is talking about just this thing. In Advent, we are watching and waiting and preparing for the one who is to come, the Christ child. We are watching and waiting and preparing for Christ to return. Brother Curtis Omquist of SSJE asks, in Advent, are we waiting on God? Or is God waiting on us? The answer, he says, is yes. If we choose to follow the little child who is on his way to us, each one of us will be challenged to completely change direction. Now that will mean something different for each one of us. But Jesus never stops calling us to follow him. As we wait and watch and prepare for the arrival of the Christ child, what is it God is waiting on us to do? What is it God is waiting on you to do? That is central to what Advent is all about. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.